in ancient Greece, um, peddlers would go from village to village and they would call out, what do you lack? What do you lack? And for them, it was a way of, of, of announcing to the neighborhood that, that they were in the village, that they were close by, that they were in your, in your neighborhood. But it was also in the sense that they would not tell you what their wares were, or what they were selling, is that what they wanted to do was entice some of your curiosity. Hey, maybe that, that guy has something I need, or that I lack, or that I desperately need. But part of that was also, he wanted, he couldn't sell anything unless he could get people to come down to his wagon or his car to see all that he had on display, unless they would come. So he used, what do you lack? What do you lack? Hoping that somebody would think, oh gosh, maybe that guy has that little doohickey that I need to make my life better. Well, this morning as you come to worship, I ask you the same question. What do you lack? What do you lack? We all come for worship for one reason or another. Uh, some of us come for, for many reasons that we come. Some of us come to be fed, that we might be, in, our, our, our tanks are empty and we need to be refilled. Some of us need that healing touch. Some of us are looking for that, that peace of mind or somebody is just looking for some kind of assurance. Maybe they need their, their faith recharged. So I, I invite you to, to take kind of an inventory of your own life. What, what is it that you lack? What is it that you're, you're longing for? What is it that you're missing? in your life. I believe that Jesus can provide that for you. Jesus provides those, those priceless things that, that help us endure and, and to endure this, this life that we live. Sometimes the strength and courage that we have. Sometimes opening our eyes to the, the faults that we have in our own lives and in, in making our, our families or our lives better. But I believe Christ has that key that, that helps unlock those places where we need that, that encouragement in our lives. This morning I want to turn to the, to the seventh chapter of, of John where we have some stories of, of healing because I believe that many of us come just to be healed from, from the much in life. The seventh chapter, 20, verses 24, and, uh, and uh, there's two stories. From there he set out, Jesus set out and went away to the, the, the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard from him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile from Syrophoenicia origin, from Phoenicia basically. She, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, she, she was not Jewish, she was Gentile, remember. He said to her, let the children be fed first, the children of God, the Jews. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. You see what Gentile, or what the Jews thought of Gentiles. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. It was a very, very good answer. Then Jesus said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And so she went home and found the child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. And then he returned from this region. He's making a, a big circle above the north of, of the Sea of Galilee, from this region of Tyre, and went on on the way of Sidon, uh, towards the Sea of Galilee, in the region of Decapolis. Now, Decapolis is, is an area that, that Alexander uh, the Great had, had, uh, had taken, and what, what he would do to hold that would be to create ten, ten little cities that would be like fortresses to protect and to hold that territory. Decapolis was, the word de de deco is ten, that is one of those ten villages. They brought to him, the people there at Decapolis brought to him a deaf man who had, been, had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him, to Jesus, to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside and in private, away from the crowd, and put his finger into his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. They looked up to heaven at his side. They said to him, Epha, 
Tata, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They, they were surrounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So what do you lack? What is it that is missing from your life? This deaf man who was also mute, um, in the sense he had a, a speeching impediment. You can imagine if you were born deaf, you would have trouble understanding and speaking words, that they just would not come out right. And so he had a struggle in, in, in any kind of communication at all. You know, our senses are, are probably one of the most priceless gifts that we have. Our, our seeing and our, our hearing, but also the, the senses of, of taste and, and smell and feel. I've gone to, to workshops where we, we spent the weekend kind of focusing in on each one of the senses at a time, asking sometimes foolish questions that I think at the time, if there was any of your senses, which one would you miss the most? I don't know, if I, if I didn't have hearing, then I would have heard you just say that, so I could go back and take a nap at my, my little room at my retreat, but how can you, it would be like choosing which child do you love the most. It, it, it is, the senses are so important to us in understanding, but in this particular scripture, it's important why Mark places this scripture in the midst of his, his book. Because, you see, all of the prophecies of Isaiah all point to the Messiah who is going to come and open the eyes of the blind and the mouths of the mute. Do you open the eyes and the mouths of those who cannot see and could not uh, speak? That is one of the clear symbols and signs and prophecies that we have from Isaiah that points to the Messiah. And if you, if you heard what I said in the last sentence of this, the people were amazed at how well he did all that. For then they were realizing that what we have is the Messiah in our presence. For only a Messiah could do such healing and such power. But I can't imagine going through life without being able to hear. To hear the, the voice of a little child. To hear the, the sounds of, of rain on the top of our tent hear the words, I love you. To hear the crunch of a watermelon like I did yesterday when I put the knife in it first and it split open. I love that sound. <laughs> but I just can't imagine what it would be like to go without hearing. When we were on vacation uh, in, in Wyoming, in, in, um, in the uh, Bighorn, National Forest, uh, we stopped by a place where there was a waterfall and there was a ranger there who was uh, eating lunch. We decided we also would be having lunch while we were there. And, and well, so uh, we were under this thunderous waterfall. I mean, it was, it was a gorgeous waterfall and, and such, but you couldn't hear anything you said. So, so it was kind of nice for, for Janet and I to have that quiet time. You know, after riding the car so long, we had that. But there was this this ranger that was right there, her name was Abigail Haas. Abigail was, was sitting there having her lunch as well and, and looking up. And I, and I spoke to her and she didn't turn. And I, I, I kind of assumed that it was the waterfall and the noise of it that she didn't, didn't hear what I just said. I said, is this where you, you come for lunch every, 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 uh, every day? It's beautiful. And uh, she didn't hear me. And so I went over to her and then she looked up and I said, Oh, hi. And she said, oh, hi, back to me. Well, as we started having this conversation, uh, I, she began to say that I am, I am deaf. I am deaf. And I can only, I can only read your lips. And so Jan and I were, were, were conversing with, with Abigail there underneath this waterfall, kind of enjoying that. And, and Abigail was the only one that could hear us. You know, we couldn't hear each other because she could read our lips. And so we said, let's go back here in the shade and, 
and, and visit was a little bit quieter. But Abigail's story was an interesting story. She was not born deaf. She had incredible speech. But at the time when she was in her late teens, she had such a horrible disease that it took her hearing away from her. And yet she was able to go on and, and, and get a master's degree. And she was there as a, as a park ranger and, and, and was able to do so without any hearing. But she could read people's lips and she could speak impeccably, better than I can. <laughs> incredible. What was even more incredible was her assignment for that summer, this summer, was to find out how many mountain lions lived within that, the, the Bighorn National, National Forest. And so as she was talking to us, um, these mountain lions are, are predators. They're, they're, they're a big cat. And, and they're like the, the cats that we have in our home. They love to, to sneak up on their prey and then pounce upon them. And as we got to talking to Abigail, we got to asking her, well, if you can't hear anything that you say, how can you hear? How can you, how can you trust that there isn't a mountain lion behind you that's your prey? She was an incredibly brave woman to go out in the forest and to find those spots where she knew the mountain lions were and to sit quietly and to count and to see and to witness them. She was also the person that recommended that we read Death in Yellowstone. And it was from that that we decided that from then on we were carrying bear spray. So we had asked her if, uh, and later on uh, emailed, do you carry mountain lion spray? And there, there's nothing that will take a mountain lion out, I tell you. But there again, even in her being deaf, she was able to hear better than than, than we were in the midst of the noise of what was a beautiful day sitting underneath a waterfall. And what Jesus is talking to us about is, is, is talking about he came not only to bring um, hearing to those who were deaf, but more importantly, he brought bring the message of the love of God to people's hearts. What Jesus was more concerned about was not so much do you listen as do you hear with your heart? You may be listening, but do you really hear with your heart? Many years ago, uh, uh, as a young pastor, I was called at the church by a desperate mother who said, well, you've got to come, Pastor Steve, you've got to come right away. Our daughter is locked up in, in her bedroom and she's, she's, she wants to commit suicide. And so I, I just dropped everything I did and I and I got over to the house as quickly as I could because that desperate voice was real. There was tears in those, that voice, but also the word suicide meant for me and for any of us so we don't ignore it. And when I got there, as soon as I got to the house, she was watching for me. She grabbed my hand and we went right back into uh, her daughter's door. And, and, and uh, she led me right, right there when she began knocking. Now, Jenny, Jenny, open up. Pastor Steve's here. I want you to listen to what he has to say. And tell by the way what this problem was. <laughs> I said, Mom, I said, Mom, would you go, go to some other part of the house? Let me, let me talk to Jenny by myself. So I, I said, Jenny, are you there? I could hear her crying. Can you come to the door? Just, I'll sit here by the door and you and I can, can visit. So I was beginning to break the ice and trying to get my way into the door and, and just to be with her just so I could see her face to face. It wasn't long before I said, Jenny, can, can we talk? Can you, can you open the door? While she unlocked the door, I said, does that mean I can come in? She goes, yes, yes. So I opened the door and there is she is, she's crying on her bed. And I, I said, Jenny, you know, tell me what your problem is. What, what is really the problem? And she says, my, my parents give me everything I want. And they just gave me this new car. 
Look, look at my closets. They're full of anything that I want. And all I want, all I want is their love. That's all I want is for them to give me words of love. To tell me I love you. So Jane, that's, that's beautiful in the sense that you know what you need and you know what you want. So I, I said, can we go and talk to your folks? So she said yes, and so let's, we went down to the dining room and sat there. And as we sat there, um, I hardly got seated down because I, I took time to sit Jenny down and the other two were there and Dad was saying, Don't you ever do this again! Don't you ever pull another stunt like this again! And the mom was pulling her hair out saying, Jenny, how could you ever even think about something like this? We give you everything you want! Bingo. Bingo. I said, we're not getting anywhere this way. I said, would you let Jenny talk? She has something to say. And I don't want any of you to say anything. So Jenny began to say, Mom and Dad, thank you for everything you've given me. But I wish you would just tell me once in a while that you love me, that you care about me, that you even want me. And that's when Mom and Dad began to cry. They finally were able to hear with their hearts what Jenny was trying to act out in wanting to commit suicide in detention with folks. We live in a world where we have this issue that we listen, but we don't really listen. We listen, but we don't really listen. We don't listen with our hearts. And that's what Christ came as he came. He came that, that we might be able to listen with our hearts. As he spoke, to the crowds, he was oftentimes staying on the side for those who have ears, listen. Because he was speaking to the crowds that also included the Pharisees, who for years had turned their ears blind, not filled their ears, covered, whatever. Stop listening to God, but was more concerned about their own, their own lives and, and filling up their coffers. They had become spiritually deaf, even though they could still hear. I believe that many of us are spiritually deaf in the sense that we don't listen to our hearts. I think that, that hearing is one of the greatest problems we have in our world today. I believe that it is listening that, that, that has hurt many marriages, that it has broken up many families, have sent many children off away, running away from home, and has dissolved many, many of friendships because we would not listen. We would not listen with our hearts. And what Jesus is saying to us is that for us to get the message that God loves us, we need to listen with the heart. But do we listen to what Jesus is saying? When Jesus speaks the words, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, do we listen or do we really listen? When Jesus says and teaches us how to pray, let's forgive as you have forgiven us. Do we listen? Or do we really listen? When he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. Do we listen? Do we really listen to what words Jesus is saying to us? Because he's wanting us to be able to listen to our hearts. This last week, I have been torn uh, by watching the news. I don't know if you're watching the news, but as I watch those who are refugees who are making their lives away from from Syria and Iraq in the midst of the horror and the terror that they live in, their fear of life and living under the fear of a bomb going off in their home, destroying them. They're, they're running 
literally like an exodus, like, like the Hebrew people were running from Pharaoh in the wilderness. Refugees who are, are looking to find a better life. And their families deserve a better life, not to have to live in that horror and terror. Yet part of the world is divided on whether they should send them back or, 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 or keep them at their border or to allow them in. There are those, and I'm, I'm glad to hear, there are many of those who are Christians who are stopping by and offering them water and food, whatever that is that, that they need to be able to continue their journey to countries who are, are welcoming the, these refugees. But the horror that we see of a policeman picking up a little little child off the beach of a lake who drowned as they tried to do whatever they could to escape the life that they had. There was a little girl who was very special, Danielle Kit Ruth, and I wish I could put this up on the screen because she she's basically like a child, but she's the same age as my, as my children. She's almost 30 years old. And I want you to hear this. And I want you to listen with your hearts. This was sent to Pastor Chris. Pastor Chris is now the pastor of the church where I served, where Daniel is a member. This year, 2015, marks a very special milestone for my mom, Helen Carruth. She's been here in the U.S. Uh, for 60 years and a citizen for 48 years. She came here back in 1955 with her parents, brother, and grandmother from Venezuela to escape poverty and the brutal dictatorship that plagued South America at the time. I'm sharing my mom's story with you, Pastor Chris, to share with the congregation during both services to remind everyone to never forget where they came from and to never pass judgment on anyone wanting to come to America for a better life based on one bad apple that might, be, might get in trouble and be, and be a lawbreaker. Because not all immigrants are troublemakers. All they want is to have a better life for themselves and their families. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for letting me share my mom's story with you and the congregation. Thanks again, Danielle Carruth. Now, Danielle is a child that has really never grown up, and yet, in her own way, has told her own story about the need to be listening. Now, I don't know where you fall in on, 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 on the immigrant issue, but what I'm concerned more about are those who are, are making their way and trying to find a way where they can get their families out of Iraq and out of Syria. As I see the horror of walking and the children and, and such, I want you to know that the United Methodist Church are part of that group that's there offering their relief. We're there at stations offering them water and support and help. Some of what you have made in, in, in the health kits are being dispersed upon those who literally left their homes with what they could carry on their back. And so yes, yes, you do make a difference. But what I want you to be thinking about is, is listening. Listening. Because I believe sometimes when we listen, it is God who is really speaking to us. When we feel moved by the news, what can we do to help? May it be prayer, may it be a donation that would help Umcor, help those who are trying to find their way to a place where they find safety and security for their families. That's what I believe the church should be. And the church should be about listening listening with our hearts. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, I come to you this morning with a heart that is broken by the sadness that I see in our world and the cruelty that we express to even the little ones, the helpless, 
the ancient even, Lord, who, who have to deal with the horror of, of war. Gracious God, help us in the healing of our world. Help us in the caring for those who are looking for just a place to raise a family and to share in a better life. May we as a church be a church that cares. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.